This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I am your host, Sean Dustin. Today, I am talking to Jeffrey Deskovic. De- Deskovic or Vic? Nick. Deskovic. And uh, this is a wrongful conviction story, another one. Uh, although this one has a way better ending than some of the other ones that I've, I've covered. Um, Jeffrey is a very, 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 uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, determined and driven individual. And uh, I'm not going to give too much away. I, I'd like to have him tell the story himself. So, Jeffrey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Do you prefer Jeffrey or Jeff? Jeff. It's uh, less formal. More formal. All right, All right Jeff. Jeff, good to meet you, man. Uh, glad you could make it and stop by and uh, join me today on the show. And, um, yeah, I, I'd love to hear the story. It's uh, It sounds super inspirational. And, uh, yeah, go for it. Sure. So, I mean, I spent 16 years in wrongfully in prison uh, in New York uh, for a murder and rape, which I didn't commit. I was um, 16 when I got arrested. Um, I um, got bailed out. I lost the trial when I was 17. So I was in prison from May 17 to 32 uh, prior to DNA testing exonerating me um, 14 years ago. So... Wait, so did you have to go to like CYA or did you go straight into the adult system? I went right into the adult system. I have been charged as, as an adult. I'm at age 16 years old. If you're you know, arrested for a rape and murder, you can be charged as an adult and therefore tried uh, in an adult courtroom and, and sentenced as an adult and sent to uh, uh, an adult prison, which is what um, happened to me. Man, I can't imagine that. Like, I've done prison my time myself, and that was in my 30s, and I was pretty scared when I went for the first time. So I, I would imagine as a, as a 16, 17-year-old uh, walking into a yard, um, and I, I imagine, did you start off at a high level or? Yeah, I was sent to a maximum security prison because, you know, I had a 15 to life sentence. And, you know, so that, because of that, then I was sent to a men's maximum security prison. And yeah, absolutely. I was uh, frightened for sure. I mean, and I'd never been arrested before. You know, I'd never been to prison before. And I was, you know, 17 years old. I was like maybe 150 pounds soaking wet. And I'm in a men's maximum security prison, you know, and then I have a bullseye on my back because, you know, I'm wrongfully convicted of a rape along with a the murder. You know, as a vigilante mentality was people have been convicted of sex offenses. So, you know, definitely, um, you know, the idea that some the prisoners would discover what I was incarcerated for and then I could be attacked, I could lose my life, any number of things could have happened. So that was, you know, that was always a concern. It was always in the back of my mind. And, you know, throughout the years, you know, I mean, let's be for real. What, what was I going to do as a 17 year old against fully formed adults, you know? So, you know, there were times throughout my incarceration, I was beat up one time when I nearly lost my life. But look, when I got in my uh, mid 20s, you know, occasion here and there, I would start coming up with victories here and there. But, you know, but still, I mean, I wasn't a street kid and that was not, I was not running the streets or a low, it's a low level crime. And I think maybe I'd been in two or three fights in my life before that. So. Yeah, that's a, uh, wow, man. I couldn't imagine that. You just got, we got a double whammy there. Um, and so, I mean, anybody, it doesn't matter if you're on the receiving end or the giving end of, of any kind of physical altercation. I mean, it, it creates PTSD. Just, just the environment in itself creates PTSD because you're always on heightened alert. You know, you don't, you never know if something's going to jump off. And so, I mean, that, that in itself is almost the same. It's so similar to, I think, what uh, people in, in combat situations deal with as well, because it's, it's that heightened alert that you're, you're never able to really relax. Yeah, that's exactly, uh, yeah, that, that, that's exactly correct. That, you know, and people who have studied the impact of wrongful imprisonment on people wrongfully convicted, um, they do say that the closest thing to that would be like a soldier come, um, coming back. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll share that for about six years. I used to go to therapy four times a week. You know, I mean, it's common um, post-traumatic stress disorder and similar symptoms such as panic attacks, anxiety, um, feeling of having been frozen in time, feeling of um, uh, processing things at a slower speed, feel, if you're on seeing law enforcement. So there's all that going on, you know, psychologically in terms of after effects and 
you know, and then there's, you know, the stigma, you know, you, I was in prison for 16 years wrongfully, yes, but I was there for 16 years, so how much of that rubbed off on you, is it safe to be alone someplace with you, uh, then there's, uh, you know, the technology was much different, so mm -hmm. cell phone, GPS, internet, that hadn't been uh, invented before, so it was kind of a fish out of water that way in terms of technology, and culture was different, and cities and towns didn't look uh, the same uh, any, anymore either. And then plus on top of that, just the years I was in prison from age 17 to 32, you know, a lot of growth and development happened at that point. So when I was released, I had to do things for the first time. So I had to get a driver's license. I had never lived alone before. I never went shopping before. Uh, so, you know, I never wrote a check or balanced the budget. So all those things made, made it uh, particularly um, difficult for me. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like it. So let's uh, we'll go back a little bit and talk about the story itself. Um, yes, I've I can connect this. to your Wi Fi network. You can find setup instructions oh in the help section with your Alexa. That's all right. I'm sorry, that's well, Alexa. Alexa, shame on you. <laughs> Another piece of technology, right? Yeah, yeah, no worries, man. All right. Yeah, so the year was uh, 1990, and the place was Peekskill, which is in Westchester County, New York. So it was the suburbs. It was, uh, I would describe it as a middle-class uh, city, ethnically diverse. Uh, there hadn't been a murder there in approximately 20 years, so this created an atmosphere of fear, rumor, paranoia. Uh, parents were concerned with their own safety as well as the safety of their children. Uh, I kind of lived a double life as a kid. So after school in the apartment complex where I grew up at, I was like one of the main two kids. So like whatever I would suggest would be what we would do. I mean, we're going to play kickball, basketball. We're going to ride bikes. We're going swimming. We're going to play video games or we're going to do Monopoly or any number of kid games. So uh, that, but that was after school, you know, in school, you know, it was a different, the kids were like a year or two older than me. So they were into like, you know, keg parties and drinking and chasing girls and, you know, organized sports, and that really wasn't where I was at. So, you know, I was kind of like tight and quiet and withdrawn. I didn't like fit in. So when this uh, girl was murdered uh, and raped, um, and um, she was in two of my classes as a freshman and sophomore, um, knew her name, she knew mine, that was the extent of it. We weren't even really on a high buy basis. And um, uh, so the Peak School Police, they interviewed a lot of students from the school and they told them you might want to talk to me because I didn't quite fit in. So that was how I got on their radar. Um, that was really my first brush with death and that was sentimental. And uh, they thought that my being emotional was a sign of my being uh, sorry for what I had done. And then they got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which purported to have the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator, and I had the misfortune of matching them. Uh, came from a single parent household. My father was never involved in my life in any way, and that intersected with the good cop, bad cop technique, where I began to look to the officer who was pretending to be my friend as a, uh, as a father figure. Uh, prior to being a teenager, I wanted to be a cop. So, um, you know, uh, so when I, when I, the police played this cat and mouse game with me for about six weeks. So half the time they would talk to me like I'm a suspect. And then when they would push a little too hard and I would become frightened, then Jeff as the junior detective helper theme was, was, was pushed. That intersected with what I wanted to be when I grew up before I was a teenager. So, um, so they did that for about six weeks and eventually they got me to agree to take a polygraph test, otherwise called a lie detector test. So the next day, rather than going to school, I went to the police station for this test. Because it was a school day, my mother, uh, neither my mother nor grandmother, they didn't call around looking for me. They thought I was in school. So they drove me from Peekskill to the town of Brewster, which is in Putnam County. So it was about 40 minutes away by car. So now I can't leave on my own. Uh, there's no attorney present. I, I, I wasn't given anything to eat the entire time I was there. They gave me a brochure about how the polygraph worked, but because I had, it had a lot of big words in it, I didn't understand them. Uh, but then I thought, well, I'm there to help the police. So what does it matter? Let's just get on with it. 
So they put me in a small room and uh, they gave me countless cups of coffee, which had the impact of getting me nervous. And they wired me up to this machine. And then now uh, they launched into their third degree tactics. And the polygrapher who was, he was a Putnam County Sheriff's investigator, but he was dressed as a civilian. He never identified himself as an officer. He never read me my rights. So he invaded my personal space and he um, uh, raised his voice at me. He asked me, he kept asking me the same questions over and over again. He was, you know, getting more aggressive as each hour and ferocious as hour, each hour passed by. And, you know, he kept that up for uh, six and a half to seven hours. Towards the end, he said, uh, you know, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the polygraph test that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. So when he said that to me, that really shot my fear through the roof. And that's when the officer had been pretending to be my friend. He came in the room and told me that the other cops were going to harm me, but that he'd been holding them off and couldn't do so any longer, that I had to help myself. Then he added, look, just tell them what they want to hear and stop what they're doing. You go home afterwards. You're not going to be arrested. So being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, being in fear of my life, uh, being overwhelmed emotionally and psychologically, you know, and this, this threat and this false promise. I mean, I made the decision to uh, just tell them what they wanted to hear. And by the time it was all done, I uh, collapsed on the floor and into a fatal position. I was crying uncontrollably. And obviously I was arrested. I was charged with murder and rape. You know, DNA tests came in from the FBI lab. It showed that semen didn't count in the victim. But the prosecutor gets the medical examiner to commit fraud and claim, oh, I forgot to document medical evidence uh, six months ago, hundreds of autopsies later, uh, later I, you know, I'm remembering now that I forgot to document medical evidence to show that, you know, the victim was sleeping around, which is what allowed the prosecutor to argue that it didn't matter, the DNA didn't match me. You know, and then he mentioned another youth by name that he claimed that slept with the victim, but he never um, had a DNA test performed in order to prove that, and he didn't call him as a witness. He just made the unsupported argument to the jury. On the other hand, my public defender essentially didn't defend me. He rarely met with me. He always shut me up when I tried to explain to him what happened in the interrogation room and that I was innocent. He didn't cross-examine the medical examiner who wouldn't allow me to testify. That's sort of threat and false promise because when they came to court, the cops left those details out of their story. Uh, he never explained to the jury what the DNA not matching me meant. He never used that to argue that it proved the confession was coerced and false. He never cross-examined the medical examiner. And lastly, he never should have represented me because this other youth that the prosecutor was falsely claiming had slept with the victim was represented by another, another attorney at the public defender's office and specifically by the lawyer who's supposed to be supervising him on my case. So that prevented us from asking him for a DNA sample and calling him as a witness. And so the end result of it is I was wrongfully convicted and given a 15 to life sentence. And, you know, when you're when you were explaining your the interrogation process, uh, you know, what what went through my head was uh, uh, to make making a murderer when they did uh, Brandon Desi. Yes. Yes. What? I mean, that's so wrong on so many levels, you know, but yet they they're allowed to get away with it. They're allowed to lie and do whatever they have to do in order to get you to say what, what you need them to say or what they need you to say. Um, so at what point did you decide that, um, that you were going to like, I mean, what was going through your head? You went, you, you went to prison. We know all of that. And you can imagine what that's like. We don't need to go into the details. If you want to know what prison's like, there's plenty of TV shows that you can watch that'll, that'll show you. Um, but at what point in your, in your journey of 16 years, did you, did you go, okay, well, I'm going to fight this. This isn't over. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. Did you go to the law library? Did you? Yeah, yeah, I understand your question. Yeah, All right. so very early on, uh, when I arrived at the, and I got past the reception center, you know, and I went to the, you know, the regular prison, um, I met this old timer pulled me aside and he said, look, you, you know, you, you got to go to the law library, you got to fight your case, you have to learn the law, you know, um, and I didn't need, need much convincing because I knew that I had gotten a crappy defense. And so I didn't trust lawyers to defend me anymore uh, on their own. So 
I did I did exactly what you just asked me. I did go to a law library and I used to collect articles about other people who had been exonerated and, you know, and um, I fell into like the routine. I mean, certainly getting food experience I mean, belief in God was part of that. Uh, you know, I found little, little things to do. I mean, I read, so from 1998 to 2006, I used to read three or four nonfiction books a week. So I used to go to the general library a lot. Um, had little routines. When I, what I would place, when I go to rec, when I go to the yard, you know, I engage in this elaborate delusion. I made pretend like I was a professional basketball player and <laughs> ping pong and chess. And, but it was much more than kids just, you know, imagine that kids fantasizing on the playground. I mean, I needed to leave the prison for a, a couple of hours. And so I engaged in this elaborate delusion. And really the correctional system kind of helps you along a little bit. It's not, it's not the prison warden, it's the superintendent. And you know, it's not the uh, prison guards, it's the correction officers. And, you know, you pretend you're not going to my prison assignment in the morning and the afternoon and I'm going to work or I'm going to school. You know, so all those things, you try to normalize things and you uh, find little habits. I mean, I used to listen to sports talk radio, for example, on Saturdays, but it wasn't, it wasn't simply sports talk radio. It was my lifeline to, it was my lifeline to the outside. I mean, they gave us televisions in the cell in 1998. I mean, for the most part, it stayed off because I was reading books and you know writing letters and going to law library. But when it was on, I would I would I would watch um, certain programs every week. And I you know again another delusion. I would pretend like I'm visiting with friends and I see the same program and you know so I mean all you, you find those niches and you know you, that you, I made it made a go of it and you know but maybe a key thing too just mentally is that. You know, I convinced myself that I wasn't doing some 15 or life sentence, that I was just doing a year or two to the next legal proceeding, which I was sure I was going to win because I knew I was innocent. And I naively thought that the court system got better the higher up you went. So, I mean, I kind of like lived from appeal to appeal uh, on that way. And I had to keep fighting off feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, thoughts of giving up and, you know, um, suicidal ideation. But you know, just to comment, but to digress for a second, I mean, the reason that I didn't, you know, give in to all those, the reason why I held it together mentally is because I knew that nobody was coming to my rescue. So I had to, I knew I would have to go out and recruit somebody to help build that bridge between me and the necessary legal help. So I had to hold it together to make that happen. And I frankly didn't commit suicide or try because I was too afraid. I think, like, you know, what? I'm, I'm, I'm even going to manage to get this wrong. Okay, and now I'm going to still be in here, but my neck is broken, or maybe I'm damaged myself mentally, you know, so uh, I, I didn't because of that. Yeah, it's a, that's a, a great point that you made. Um, and, you know, you, you can't, you can't, when I didn't have a lot of time, I had three years, but thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, when you think, you know, oh, you have all of this time. I mean, it just seems so insurmountable. But I mean, if right. you just go to the next, all right, let me just get to this point. And then when you get to this point and you figure it out, it's almost like it's almost like uh, like making goals for yourself. Yeah. You know, and then once once you attain that goal, OK, let's reevaluate and see where we need to go next and then next. Um, how many times did you did you get your hopes up and they just got shattered and you lost on an appeal or, you know, it's like, how many times did you get denied before they actually let you out? Yeah. So I lost seven appeals. Wow. Um, then I wrote an uncountable number of letters for four years, looking for an attorney investigator. Cause yeah, as you know, when your appeals are over, the only way back in the court is if you can find some previously unknown evidence of innocence. So I wrote letters for four years and I rarely got responses other than the occasional no. So in a way, those were like other rejections, just, you know, and then I went to the parole board where be, largely because I maintained my innocence rather than expressing remorse and taking responsibility, I got turned down there as well. Um, so all those rejections and ultimately I did win because um, a letter that I wrote to a book author in care of the publishing company was instead sent to an investigator and she agreed to help me network to the innocence project she lobbied them she got other people to lobby them and i got lucky that one of the intake workers uh represented my case um they, she presented it three times to the to the, to the lawyers so, I mean, you get presented and it's turned down that that's the end of the road but she kept presenting it and um she got them to take my case so getting their representation was the key 
the district attorney that had fought all seven of the appeals, including blocking me from getting further uh, DNA testing. <clears throat> she, um, she left office, her successor allowed me to have the testing. And then we got lucky that we were able to identify the actual perpetrator. So he had killed a second victim uh, three and a half years later for killing the victim in my case. He had gotten caught for that. And as a result, his DNA was put into the data bank so that when I did get the testing, that um, it matched him and then he then confessed. And so my case was ultimately, you know, dismissed on actual innocence grounds, whereas he was arrested and not convicted for crime. So I have a, I have, I have a two part question. Um, the first part is, is, is how prevalent is wrongful conviction? I mean, it seems like every time you're looking at something, you know, there's tons of stories that come out about people being wrongfully convicted and, uh, and winning. Um, that's the first, like how prevalent do you feel that that is? And then the second part would be what advice, well, not go ahead and finish that one because you might forget. Yeah, sure. So uh, look, you, you can't really measure the number of wrongful convictions. You can only really measure the exonerations. Mm -hmm. That's the ones that you know about. So, uh, you know, they're, according to the National Registry of Exoneration, the, the total number of exonerations across the country from 1989 forward is at 2,691. Those are the people that have made it out. Um, I, I, it's different estimations. I mean, I, I've seen 1%, half a percent, 3%, 3 to 7%. I personally think that it's 15 to 20%. Um, I think that the, I think that it's much higher than what these conservative numbers are. And when I think about my 18 to 19 people that I did time with have been exonerated either before me or after me. Um, I think about other things like, you know, most of the organizations in the field, they only take on DNA cases. So that's only around five to 12% of all serious felony cases. So most of those people don't have anyone that's willing to work on their case pro bono seeking to exonerate them. So those are many cases that we'll never learn about it was a Wayne State University study in regard that estimated 10,000 people were wrongfully convicted each year. So I think then the number is 15 to 20 percent. Man, that's still a lot. Now, would you would you say that it's most of this is just due to poorly trained investigators or a police officer or law enforcement, or is just being lazy? Uh, uh, well. I think well. I, I mean, it all starts on the level of the of the police. I, I don't. I don't think that you know they're, you know, I think they need to be trained better. I don't think that they know like what the red flags are that an identification you know may, might be mistaken that a confession is um maybe maybe uh maybe false or that you know or that an informant is lying. So I mean, it starts there. Uh, there is misconduct. A lot of times there is misconduct in the part of the police as far as you know not documenting witness interviews or coming to court in line, which is called test the line or withholding evidence of innocence. Some of it is uh, tunnel vision when they only pay attention to evidence that uh, confirms their conclusion. But that's on the police level. But I mean, and the prosecutors, I mean, they're not looking for wrongful conviction cases. They're also yeah, are, are not familiar with what the red flags are. And, and I think that they get caught up instead of trying to pursue justice, they're just there to win. Uh, prosecutorial misconduct is a major factor in wrongful conviction cases. It runs through most of them. In terms of the causes of wrongful conviction, I mean, you mentioned tunnel vision and the police misconduct. Uh, the prosecutorial misconduct, as far as um, not turning over evidence of innocence or you know making making improper opening or closing remarks, but we have the systemic thing still. I mean, coerced false confessions at twenty five percent of the DNA proven wrongful convictions, misidentification at 75%, lying informants, 15%. Bad lawyering is, is definitely a big part of um, uh, wrongful convictions uh, being caused. I mean, there's forensic fraud, there's junk science, things that have been accepted into the courtroom as evidence, uh, things like um, bite marks and tire tracks and footprints, which are sound scientific, but there's it's actually not. I mean, hair comparison. The reason why it's not is because there are no, there are no comparative tables. No one knows what the error rate is. So to say that your the footprint happens to match, you know, the size shoe and type of footwear you're wearing. Okay, yeah, you and what ten thousand, hundred thousand. How many other people could have generated that? So it's not really very statistically significant at all. So when I think about all those causes and 
you know, how just one, uh, I mean, I remember there was one rogue um, a forensic analyst, Annie Duquesne from Pennsylvania, and she went to prison for a couple of years because she was just falsifying test reports and even doing the testing. And there were several thousand cases right there. Uh, you look at um, Brooklyn, there was a disgraced detective, uh, Scarcella, uh, 17 people that he, uh, you know, arrested have been exonerated uh, so far. And th those are just examples how one rogue actor can impact many, many people. So all those things go into my estimation and thinking, okay, this is maybe 15 or 20%. So as an attorney yourself, um, yes. and we haven't got to that part yet, but the question that I, the next question that I have pertains to lawyers, prosecutors, um, you know, judges and the police department. Do you feel that if qualified immunity was removed from all of them, that they would, we would see a, a huge difference in the way things are done? 100%. Yes, I do. So qualified immunity, you know, is, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, even just, uh, you know, prosecutorial, I mean, the judges have absolute immunity and, the, you know, the prosecutors have their prosecutorial immunity. So what that means in terms of the prosecutors is that, you know, no matter how serious the misconduct is that they commit, I mean, it, it, they could withhold evidence of innocence or they could suborn perjury or threaten witnesses or not correct perjured testimony. It doesn't matter how egregious it is that they do it after an arrest has been made, then they have immunity for it, which means you can't you can't sue them. So like I sued the prosecutor anyway, and I lost that part of my lawsuit because of uh, immunity. So I do think that if that was removed, then you would see a big uh, you would be a, you would see a big change then. But I also think that when there's clear cut intentional misconduct, you know, I think that that should be criminalized. I think that there should be an incarcerated penalty as well because why should we have a class of people that are above the law. No, that, that's absolutely right. And I mean, we're seeing that today in our own society play out in, in the things that are going on right now. And, you know, if you, you start throwing people, you start throwing people's asses in jail, things start changing, you know, oh, you know, now, now it's, now it's a big, oh, now I want to do the right thing. Right. It's a yeah. uh, yeah, jail is, is definitely a, a, a for, for most is an attitude adjustment, you know, um, sure. or at least the threat of, of being, having that over your head. Um, I think the next question that I have for you, and then we can move into the, uh, to the next part of your story and how you became a lawyer and, you know, what the, how you managed to do that. Um, but this is more for like family members that may be watching for somebody that they feel is wrongly fully convicted in their own family. Um, and they're at the point where, you know, all the appeals are lost and everything else. Like, what would you suggest to them um, to, to get them through or, or where they should look or what they should do? Right. So I think that what they should do is so the, the defendant himself, the person who's in prison himself, they need to put together like a really short, nice and tight letter. You know, first sentence, my name is so-and-so and I've been wrongfully convicted of such and such. You know, I've been sentenced to such and such amount of time and I've currently been in prison for such and much. Uh, next sentence, I'm innocent. Next, mention what is the evidence, the evidence used to convict me was. Bang, and don't soft pedal, don't leave anything out. If you do, you're all done. Uh, next thing, then you would then, the problem with that evidence, you mention what the flaws are. Next thing, Mention the top two or three facts in the record that can be verified that are the best facts pointing to your innocence. Next thing, the reason why I am writing you is because neither I nor my family have any money with which to hire an attorney and investigator, and we would like you to consider taking my case pro bono. Next sentence would be, you know, here are some directions to go in investigative wise that I think possibly could turn up some previously unknown evidence of innocence. Next sentence, I have legal documents to prove what I'm saying. I'm not sending them to you right now out of respect for your time. Uh, please let me know if you'd like to see any of them. And then you end the sentence. So you have to have that really nice and tight, you know, you can't airtight type of thing. And then you, you spray it around. Keep track of the places that you contact. And this is where the family part of it comes in. And, you know, just doing, putting together like a document that list all the large firms, mid-sized firms, and small places, you know, that have a pro bono section, and, you know, they will advertise that. 
you make a list of them, you make a list of other lawyers that, and you know, mid, large, middle, solo, down to solo practitioners that don't have a pro bono section on it. And you wanna fo follow up and spray that letter around and keep track of you know, what date and follow up periodically. And the idea is you're trying to catch lightning in a bottle you know, that somebody will agree to pick up your case. Okay, no one's gonna decide to represent you based on one letter. Well, all you're trying to do as the letter writer in that situation is you want to get somebody's attention. You want them to think, well, yeah, if that is true, then I could see how they might be wrongfully convicted. Yeah, let me look into this just a little bit more. You know, so that's all you're trying to generate as the writer. So most people, they write way too much you know, they flood people with details. It's too hard to follow. They send all their legal work. The more you send, the less likely you're going to get a response. So that's in terms of a methodology of looking for help. I mean, look for an innocence project that's in your geographical entity, uh, area, but you're not going to limit it to that, okay? Because remember, most of them only do DNA cases. So that's that would be one thing. Another thing, uh, definitely learn going to the law library is important. Um, reading about other wrongful conviction cases, the, the ones, especially the ones that ended in exoneration. You know, I did, I did that and uh, I was um, looking for inspiration to keep going. Uh, then I was also looking at what route did they take, who literally helped them, and those are other people to contact. So those were things I would say avoid the prison politics. I and mean, look, your goal is to regain your freedom, overturn the conviction, regain your freedom, rejoin your family, live your life, right? Like nothing going on in the prison for the most part of any kind of importance. So don't don't get distracted. Uh, I would say use your time wisely. I mean, I took vocational programs and educational programs, anything that had any kind of potential benefit for me if and when I was able to come back home. That's how, that's the programs that I focused in on um, taking. So those are the things that, those are the things that um, work for me. Um, you can, in terms of this, the outside contact's important. So, I mean, so if you are, like your family member is wrongfully imprisoned, I mean, getting as many people from the family and friends just to ma maintain touch. I mean, I know, I know somebody, they have, they, they take a systematic approach to it. They work the visit schedule and, okay, we have a slot this weekend. And, mm -hmm. but if everyone just does a little bit, you know, maybe you pop up and see someone once every two months, but other people are doing the same thing and they have a different person to call, you know, once, in, you know, and it was a letter or a card or something. I mean, all of that's important to help on the, on the morale level of it. So all that stuff counts to me. Yeah, that's great information, man. Thank you. Here and now we're going to get to the bonus part of this because this this is definitely um, what sets what sets this story apart from most wrongful convictions is the path that you took when you got out. Right, right. So when I was released, um, you know, I did a two and a half to three and a half hour off the cuff presentation at the press conference. Everything I'd ever wanted to say, but couldn't get anyone to hear. For six yeah. years. And just as I thought I was wrapping up, a different topic came to my mind. And I just started elaborating on that before I knew where all that time passed. And that was kind of my aha moment that I realized that, you know, I could be part of the innocence movement without necessarily being an attorney. So I, um, for about five years, I was an individual advocate. So, I mean, I was speaking and, you know, and I had a, um, Nate was making some money doing speaking engagements in New York and across the country. And I was doing media interviews, um, basically trading privacy for awareness. Uh, I became a weekly columnist. So um, I was doing that and I was meeting elected officials. You know, one thing that crossed my mind, you know, when I was in prison, I used to read about people who were exonerated. They would get their initial five minutes of fame and then they disappear. And I always used to frustrate me, like, you know, why don't they reach back and like try to help the rest of us? Why don't they at least raise awareness about that their case is not isolated, that there are other people wrongfully in prison. So when I found myself unexpectedly free, I kind of drafted myself and I said, you know, you were pretty critical of everybody and now you're unexpectedly free. So why don't you get out there and show them how it's done? You know, so hence my motivation that way. And, you know, I needed to, you know, I need to make my suffering count for something, you know, and I do believe that my purpose in the world is to fight wrongful conviction. And, you know, and and, and uh, doing the advocacy work is a way to express that, and that's how I I take that energy that I would otherwise feel, and I channel it to that work. And so you know, I'm not an angry or a uh, bitter person. So I did that for about five years, and uh, then I received some financial compensation, and and I wanted to be more involved. I want to continue to do policy and education work, but 
uh, I wanted to be involved in freeing people who were wrongfully imprisoned. So I took some of the money and I started uh, the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which would continue the policy and public education work, but more importantly, we have the additional element of you know, uh, freeing people who are wrongfully in prison. So we've been able to get uh, eight people home. We were wrongfully in prison. We have 11 active cases now. I'm um, an advisory board member of a coalition group called It Could Happen to You, which um, the foundation is part of in New York. So I was, uh, the foundation was able to help pass laws pertaining to DNA database expansion, better identification procedures, videotape and interrogation. Through the coalition, we passed an oversight board called the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct. So oversight for the prosecutor, we passed discovery reform, so that is a better process in New York in terms of information sharing between the defense and prosecution. Uh, we just passed the, we passed the law in Pennsylvania pertaining to expungement. So we're working on a policy level in New York, California, and Pennsylvania. So the foundation does its policy work now just through that bigger coalition group, and that's it's um, more uh, effective that way. Um, but at some point, uh, sitting in the front row of the courtroom wasn't enough. So I wanted to be able to represent some of the clients myself and sit at the table and uh, hence my decision to make a second foray into law school. I tried to, I tried, when I was in prison the last few years, I thought about, you know, if I can ever get out of here, I'm going to become a lawyer, and, you know, exonerate other people in my position. Uh, I tried to do that when I came home after um, I had gotten a scholarship from Mercy College to finish the bachelor's degree and and I, I took the LSAT, I tried to get into law school and I, my score was frankly too low and I didn't get in. But maybe seven years later, you know, I thought about it again, I made a second attempt and I got through. And so I graduated this past May to 2019. And uh, so my birthday is October 27th and uh, I got a birthday gift early, uh, the day before I got, the, got admitted to the bar. So I actually am an attorney now as well. Well, congratulations, man. That's, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Um, what, uh, there was another, there was one more, there's another, one more question I have, and then we can, uh, we can go and wrap up is, uh, the conspiracy, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. uh, the conspiracy, conspiracy law as an attorney. And, you know, it's you, it's, 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 I feel like that law conspiracy cases in general, I mean, it, they're so vague and you can't fight them. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. How are you going to prove you didn't conspire with somebody? You know, it's very, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is vague. It's very, it is a very unfair, it is a very unfair thing. Uh, I do want to mention that there is a documentary short out about me uh, called um, Conviction, which is available now on Amazon Prime. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been selected in 10 different film festivals. We recently won the uh, Best Cinematography and Best Documentary uh, Award. So uh, that's making the rounds. People can, can, um, can check that out. Uh, we're in the process of converting uh, conviction to an hour and a half uh, feature, so it'll it'll um, have a bigger bigger version of that, and you know that's really has been a major tool in raising awareness and getting my story out there, representing the foundation and the general problem of, of uh, wrongful conviction. I've been able to you know continue to keep the media stuff going, and that's a big thing. You know, is that I figured out as long as I can give like some there's some new element or something that I can keep the media attention going. You know, and so that's how I've been able to uh, to do that, and just certainly having the nonprofit organization and doing the advocacy work, and now becoming a lawyer. You know, I'm st I'm still able to stay relevant in the news, and you know, I think that you know that's really um, important. If you the more you you can raise awareness about the issue, then the more the environment is right for change and for other people to uh, get involved in one way or another. No, absolutely. And there's so many different ways now to be able to get stories out there. Podcasting is, is I mean, it's been around for a long time, but it's, you know, the, I think the, uh, the, pan, the lockdowns and the shutdowns and all this other stuff have really brought them to the forefront because for a while it's all anybody can do is, uh, well, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, and similar, similar thing, I mean, podcasts, I mean, blogs, blog mm -hmm. talk radio, I mean, the media is more accessible now to the general public, you know, to get your voice out there. Um, certainly documentaries and docu-series have, have really been big. I mean, you know, things like Making a Murderer and, you know, other documentary, I feel like uh, When They See Us, you know, has um, all those things really have raised the level of uh, of awareness. And I do think we're making some inroads in terms of police and prosecutors and uh, judges. And I do believe that each person that makes it out makes it just a little bit easier for the next person to um, to to get out. Because, I mean, the fight most of the time is not simply 
the the evidence and, and the law, but but it's also but it's also that I mean you know can can you get in front of an objective judge, you know? Um, so I think judges now are taking things a little bit more 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 serious, and, you know. And that's really an important thing in terms of being able to um, win your case. Um, you know, I just want to change topics for just a second. Just in within the documentary conviction, I just want to point out that I mean, one of the things I was able to do there, and I feel really fortunate, you know, that the producer um, Gia Works was on the same page as me. But it's not just innocence driven, you know, or you know, and, and about my it's sort of was mainly about my advocacy in life afterwards rather than about the case itself, which is a little bit different. So I like that aspect of it because. You know, I define myself as an advocate whose motivation, my backstory is, you know, my case, but I'm not limited to that box. So that's part of it. But then aside from that, uh, in understanding my advocacy, yeah, sure, innocence and false accusations is a major part of it, but it's not, it's not the only thing. So, I mean, in that documentary, you know, um, you know, I'm trying to carry water for the other issues. So, I mean, I'm talking about things like things you saw. You know, like el elderly in prison and the terrible medical care and, you know, have maddeningly slow, compassionate releases and, you know, and just the abuse that goes on in prison, the need for prison reform and, you know, parole reform and prisoner reentry. So I'm talking about a lot of those issues and, and I'm trying to shed some light on those as well. And I'm hoping just the fact that, you know, that I'm, that I'm innocent and I'm in some quarters, I'm, I'm perceived to be more objective, like I don't have an ax to grind as opposed to somebody saying something equally as valid, but say they're, they're on parole. So, I mean, I'm innocent like you, but I was there and I saw it and I experienced it. So raising awareness about those issues. I mean, you know, one big thing I have a problem with is that, you know, we're, people are sent to prison as, uh, uh, as, as punishment, right? With the punishment being you lost your freedom. You're not supposed to be mistreated while you're there. And that, that, that happens all too much, you know, and um, through the documentary, I'm just, I'm hoping to, you know, change some of that. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it's, it's sad that uh, your, your, your record just, it, it continues to follow you. And you may have, like I've done, I did, I got in trouble for something when I was 18. And when I ended up going to federal prison, they, it, it pushed my points up to put me into a medium when my instant offense was a camp uh, worthy offense, you know? And it's like, okay, well, how cool is that? I just, I'm getting, I'm getting punished again for something that I already did time for. It, right. Yeah. And you know, there's so much discrimination, you know, in terms of, um, you know, jobs and apartments when people have, have records, um, you know, ban the box is an issue that's gained a lot of uh, currency now. I mean, just where, you know, the, the movement is so that, you know, only after a job offer has been extended could, could they then ask about your record. And if there's no rational relationship between the crime you're convicted of and the job, then they would have to give a reason why they're withholding or withdrawing a a job opportunity. I mean, if we discriminate against people who've been incarcerated and we don't hire them, then we're making the temptation to return back to crime and going back to the old days, you know, a lot more uh, tempting. And that's just going to result in, in, you know, being, being another, another crime being committed, possibly another victim, the cost of incarcerating somebody again, as opposed to somebody that's uh, continuing to be free and is paying into the tax base. So, I mean, it just it makes sense on so many levels. I mean, just even like, um, you know, uh, college education. I mean, I, I had that much less ground to cover when I was released because they had college education in prison. I got the GED because uh, I had been arrested when I, was, you know, incarcerated when I was in high school, but then I was able to get the associate's degree and I got the, uh, another year towards the bachelor's and the funding was cut. So that meant when I came home, you know, I only had to do 10, 30 clients, 10 classes where I got the bachelor's and I had that much less ground to go and I was able to springboard from that to a master's degree and ultimately to a law degree. And I think about like the political rhetoric that, you know, surrounded that whole effort at cutting the college education for prisoners. Well, my, you know, I can't afford, you know, I don't go to college for free, so why should a prisoner, and I can't afford for my kid to go, but why should someone who committed a crime go? You know, that was, that was a false narrative because first of all, you know, the financial aid forms were the same. So anybody who was eligible to go to college while in prison would have been eligible to go on the outside uh, just by reason of the criteria in the 
uh, financial aid forms. And secondly, it was like one half of 1% of the total number of students across the country were incarcerated. So my point is that it's not like that for every person who went to college while in prison, there was someone on the outside who was denied a seat. You know, and then I think if you spend some money on the front end, you know, then uh, then we're saving money on the back end. I mean, there's a nonprofit organization, uh, Hudson Link, and they they provide college education <clears throat> for some of the prisons in, in in New York. Just using their stats as as an example, so the national recidivism rate is 68 percent. And their recidivism rate is two. So and when there was college education for prisoners, then you know recidivism rate was much lower for college educated prisoners than not. And it kind of makes sense. It's it's, it, it's kind of common sense, really. If you release somebody and you know their horizons have been broadened and you equip them to be gainfully employed, you know, then they they have a better chance of getting a better job, which means that their the temptation to go back to the old ways, go back to crime. You know, it is much, it's much less. So who do you want living next to you? Somebody that has no skills and, and now has a record and is discriminated against? Or you want someone that, you know, has a college education? You know, I mean, who's more likely to go back to crime? No, that's a, that's a good point. You made a, you made a really good point there. Um, it's, uh, and I, I also think too, as somebody who's been through it, you know, like I didn't get a chance. I had such little time. I was, I spent 18 months in the state, uh, state system got paroled out, went directly into the federal system, did another 18 months. And so I never had a chance. I had so little time at any of them that I, I you can't program because the, the waiting lists are so long. And so if you don't have a long time, you're, you're, you know, you don't get any of those benefits. And that was me. So I, what I did was, you know, I, I concentrated on the outside, you know, getting in shape and staying healthy and, you know, trying to stay out of trouble. Uh, but none of the inside got taken care of, you know, all of the criminal, cause I was a criminal. Um, and so, uh, you know, all of the, the criminality, the behaviors, all of the stuff that, that, you know, got me there never, it just, it just got buried. And then as soon as I got out it's like, boom, there it is again, you know, it pops up at some point. So, I mean, I really think that, you know, cause I'm in the re-entry space myself. I belong to a, a re-entry coalition. We probably know some of the same folks um on uh on facebook um and so you know that's that's what my goal is now and i've got a nonprofit that i'm in the in the process of forming uh for guys that are coming out um of incarceration back to the community and trying to figure out a program that i can start and and help in that in that aspect yeah sure let me just piggyback off that just you know we will i'll send you a link or something offline but you know, i am a co-owner of um, what's called recharge beyond the bars re-entry game and it facilitates uh, formerly incarcerated people with, you know, reconnecting with friends, family, and even other people incarcerated by it, the game has uh, a series of, uh, has like a lot of icebreaker type of questions. And, uh, you know, some of the organizations, some, some re-entry organizations use them uh, as a basis for group discussion or journaling, or even just playing, just straight up playing the game, you know, and I'm, I've always felt more connected with people that, that when I sit down to play that I didn't know, and, and I use the game personally you know, and it's helped a lot in terms of with my uh, extended family. So, but I, I do, you know, I do think that a lot of the uh, the same needs that exonerees have when they're released, the same thing that people have, you know, when they're, you know, when, when, when they're paroled. I mean, yeah, there's, there's 15 states that don't have compensation. And we're working on that in Pennsylvania. Um, but even the states that do have them, I mean, some of the ones that are counted, uh, like Montana, for example, they're, their version of compensation is uh, they allow you to have a university education and that's it. And all the places uh, like Wisconsin, they give you $5,000 a year <laughs> with, the, with a cap of five years. You know? um, and, but, but all the places, I mean, even New York, which I, you know, is, I would say is progressive. We have compensation statute you know, and was compensated you know, by, by them and I was able to bring federal civil suits successfully also. But they have no re-entry assistance, even for people that are exonerated. I mean, I, uh, you know, I think that things like you know housing, cost of living, mental health, doctor and general access to public transportation, classes on technology, job training, job placement. I feel like all those things should be should be offered, um, you know, for uh, people who've been exonerated rather than you know just released with nothing. I mean, it took me five years, you know, before I got anything, and I didn't get any assistance. So. 
it was a struggle. I mean, all the psychological things, the social stigma, always being passed over for gainful employment, you know, lack stability of housing. I nearly ended to a homeless shelter. And you know, I feel like when people are getting wrongfully imprisoned, I mean, it's hard enough to try to to try to re-enter and and, and uh, deal with the traumatic and all those other aspects that we've talked about earlier. But I don't, you know, but I think that there should be immediate governmental assistance, you know, provided and. I do think that yes, there should be more programs on the inside. I mean, we should get away, do away with waiting lists. Let's just put more money in to vocational training and college, and you know, and, and make sure the curriculum is up, obsolete. I mean, I I did program while I was in the state system, but most of the instructors, but they were only there for a paycheck. They would just hang out in their office and they do minimal instructing, and you know, the curriculum was obsolete. I feel like it should be should be modern and there should be, you know, tests that they can audit every so often, you know, which are, you guys have been in here for three months and let's see if this instructor really has been teaching you. What, what do you got? Let's see. You know, so yeah. I just think that that's it's an investment, you know, on ourselves as a, as a society. And, you know, you mentioned starting, you know, you're starting a nonprofit to do re-entry work. I mean, so many people who were uh, formerly incarcerated, when they come home, they want to be in job, in, involved in something that involves making a difference and giving back. And whether that's reentry or diverting people from from uh, from prison in the in, going to prison in, in the first place or doing policy work, there's a lot of really meaningful contributions that many of us make who were who were incarcerated before. And so I think equipping people with the tools that they need while they're on the inside and then assisting them more on the outside. I mean, we're, as a society, we're benefiting as people do that. So I think it's, you know, I, I guess my bottom line is that I feel like rehabilitation should be because of the system, not in spite of the system. And I don't feel like there's enough of that. Uh, now it should be facilitated you know, by the government, I think it's true. Yeah, that's a, that was another good point. So, we are rolling on the hour here. Um, any any last uh, things that you want to? Any burning desire that that you didn't touch on that you want to touch on? Well, I'll just mention that you know we uh, um, I mean, I, I we have about eleven cases that are active now. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> you know, I am in, intending to um, enter those cases as as co counsel and continue to do advocacy work. You know, we do have a crowdfunding site on Patreon. You know, my dream is what if 25,000 people were willing to part with three dollars a month on a recurring basis you know, that would give us funding that we need to hire attorneys investigators paralegals other essential personnel to you know do this advocacy work work when the uh, organization so i'm hoping that you know people will listen they'll contribute more importantly that they'll help me get the word out there social media word of mouth or anything else you know we need to expand it out and make it go as far and wide as we can so that would be something that I had a burning desire to uh, mention. Um, in terms of just general life lessons, I mean, I don't think that my story is limited to lessons uh, pertaining to the justice system. Uh, I would say things that from my surviving in prison to uh, being able to graduate law school, um, the keys, uh, keys to that would be just set, set a goal, have a plan, be flexible enough to vary the plan. Remember the goal is the goal, the route's not the goal. Be, you only change the route. Uh, don't, be, don't be afraid of hard work. You know, just take no for an answer. There are no, there are no, there are no reasons why you can't make something happen. There are reasons why it may be more difficult, but there's no, there, there is no reasons why you can't do it. You just have to leave it all out on the field, go all out for your goal. And I think if you, if you do that, you can accomplish things. And, you know, I, uh, I I live by that. You know, I don't I don't give up. And um, outside from that, uh, I'll just mention that I appreciate the small things. I mean, I I like feeling fresh air in my face and feeling the sun, or you know, being able to travel and you know, freedom of uh, movement. I mean, all these things that you know, really you don't you don't have at all in any aspect uh, once once you're you're in prison. So I appreciate the small things, and I try to live in the moment and. Uh, I love trying new things or going new places or trying new foods or having new experiences. So I guess the theme of it is don't be afraid to expand and your horizons and try different things and just the sheer amount of, you know, educational opportunities or other opportunities that exist in the world. I mean, it's there if we, it's there if we want it, but, uh, you know, we just, we need to, uh, we need to want it and, you know, maybe look at my story and then reframe the challenges that somebody has in their life and put them in perspective. I've had a lot of people 
tell me that when they do that, everything suddenly seems a lot more manageable for them. So if I can serve as an inspiration in that way, then you know, then that makes me that makes me feel good. You know, my life is all about making a difference, living a meaningful life. And I think it's important to find something that you really like doing that makes a difference, you know, rather than just doing something strictly for a paycheck. So that's really the ticket to that's really the ticket to happiness. You know? So those are my penny for my thoughts. Well, that's amazing. And that's awesome, man. And thank you. Um, yeah. And, and what I got, you know, from that is don't wait for somebody to rescue you. Right. Rescue yourself. Yeah. At least, at least start there. And then, yeah. you know, and when you're willing to rescue yourself, then people are willing to help, help assist. Right. You. Well, rescuing yourself, part of rescuing yourself is being proactive and looking for people who will assist you. That, that's what people you have to do, as opposed to just do nothing, sit there and wait for somebody completely out of the blue to contact you totally unsolicited. It's probably not going to happen that way. You know, just be willing to help yourself and work hard. And part of helping yourself is networking and looking for other people who can help you in one way or another as you move towards your goal. So I, I definitely agree with how you put it. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate you taking the time to come talk to me this morning and share your story and your wisdom and your inspiration uh, to somebody out there that uh, hopefully will get something out of this. Um, you know, a family member, you know, who knows, somebody may be listening on a, on a, on a uh, contraband cell phone somewhere, um, you know, and could and, you know, may need to hear this. So I definitely appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on uh, the passing law school that's a hell of an achievement man thank you thank you very much for having me and listen from where i came from just everyone should remember there's nowhere to go but up absolutely brother thank you <laughs>